Just waiting for people to join. Hopefully you guys can join. I don't see anybody else in here. to message people just in case you all can't join. Not sure if you can see me, but hopefully you can uh, join in. You can also use the uh, page, the Google Plus page, maybe to put a notification. We haven't used this service all that much, so I'm not sure how people can join, but uh, hopefully you can join in. Let's see.
<laughs> sorry. Um, I, I guess uh, I haven't used this uh, service all that much. So um, it looks like I can't just allow the public to join this. Um, it may be just, uh, and I see uh, Bernard on the uh, webpage here saying that all you're seeing is me just sitting down, not too inspiring. So um, I, I guess what we can do is I can try to add the people who are already shown up, and then maybe I can try to see if you can join the actual conference so that we can uh, um, actually talk. So let me... See if I can add you, and if not, then I'll just give kind of a talk about um, the Okay, Bernard, you're invited. Okay, if this doesn't work, then what I will do is just uh, is just start. Okay, so, uh, so I see Bernard, your comments on there. I'm not sure if the echo is any better now, um, but it should be it should be better. Anyway, so uh, so hopefully you can join. But I do see your comments on the page, and I'll be happy to address them if you want to leave them on the uh, Mesh Mixer 3D CAD event that you joined in with. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today is um, a general overview of 3D printing in case you didn't know it. And uh, if you have any specific questions, you can go on to the, uh, the page and ask that. And I can turn down uh, my gain a little bit there. Um, and hopefully that's a little bit better for the mic. Uh, so in general, uh, just this is the meetup group for Honeypoint 3D, and we are a San Francisco Bay Area 3D printing startup. And um, we started off our life as a retail 3D printing uh, store. We ran that for uh, since about the mid-2013, uh, and although we still do have the store, we don't um, go in there all of that much because a lot of our business has uh, started to move over towards education. Uh, when we were in the retail store, everybody who came in wanted to learn about 3D printing and 3D design. So uh, that's kind of what we um, changed our business over to. Uh, we did pay for printing, uh, rapid prototyping, and design services. Sorry, I think that uh, kind of quit out. Uh, and uh, we did corporate events and uh, various other things, but the common thread between everything was education. So we've kind of uh, switched over to uh, doing education uh, more primarily, which is what you see on our um, uh, homepage at honeypoint3d.com about our current Kickstarter, which is all about um, 3D printing and 3D design using Autodesk Mesh Mixer. So I see that uh, Bernard is talking a little bit on um, the chats. I would hope that... Um, oh, actually, we have a couple people who looks like they have joined. Um, so we do have a kind of a Q&A in here. Let me actually move this over here. Move this down a bit. 
Um, I can set up a Q&A app right here. Okay, so I see uh, Carlo said that he sees and hears me, um, but his mic is down, so no problem. You can use the Q&A app on the left-hand side, which is the little Q&A button to ask questions, and you can certainly uh, ask your questions on there, and I will answer them, so thank you, Carlo. Yep, so uh, the best is to use that Q&A um, app on the left side. Uh, so. I'll kind of talk just generally about 3D printing and um, 3D design, unless you have any specific questions, and then I can answer those, certainly. Um, and if I see some other people uh, join here, it looks like we have five viewers, um, you can always put on the uh, the main Mesh Mixer event page you found in Google, um, say that you want me to invite you, and I will invite you personally, and then you should be able to actually join in to ask questions. Kind of a weird system, but so we started our life as a retail 3D printing store uh, and turning more into education. We have done consulting with over 5,000 uh, people in terms of paid 3D printing classes, whether uh, these are kids or adults, the most of our work has been with adults. So uh, we're pretty uh, used to uh, teaching adults how to do 3D design and 3D printing. And I, I really encourage you to ask questions on the side, otherwise I'm just gonna kind of talk about 3D printing and 3D design. Uh, we sell printers. Uh, we sell printers made by a company here in the San Francisco Bay Area called Type A Machines. These are what are called FDM printers, Fused Deposition Modeling. They, right here, uh, use filament, which you can see right here, kind of a spaghetti string type of thing, and even behind me, uh, way in the back there, you can see a printer. Um, they use a filament, so they essentially melt this as uh, kind of like a hot glue gun melts uh, filament, or, or melts glue, except they deposit this really, really accurately. This is one of about 20, 30, uh, probably up to 40 or 50 different materials that you can uh, 3D print with in the consumer realm off of FDM printers. Uh, this one right here, looks like it's uh, backwards, but it's from a company called Made Solid um, that is out here in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is PET, polyethylene terephthalate. This material is the same material, I don't have any right here, um, but the soda bottles are made out of. So it is 100% recyclable in your home recycling container. Uh, so the story is, uh, really good there. The other material that we print with, I have another uh, print right here. An example of this is just kind of a flange that I printed out. Is let me move this down a little bit. Uh, is called PLA, polylactic acid. This material is 100% uh, recyclable. Uh, I'm sorry, not recyclable. 100% biodegradable. It's actually made from a type of sugar, and um, Okay, hi Barbara, um, absolutely, portable 3D scanner. Okay, I will totally talk about that. Thank you. Uh, so I will, I just let me go over the beginning of this and I'll, I'll, I, I really wanna answer your questions more than just talk, so feel free to ask as many questions as you want. Um, but uh, PLA is a polylactic acid, so it's a type of sugar, uh, non-edible, but biodegradable. Uh, medical grade versions of this are used in uh, dental work or in surgery to dissolve inside of the body. So it is a very biocompatible product. Uh, there's all sorts of different other materials that you can use in 3D printing, but we get a lot of people actually coming up, us, uh, coming up to us and saying, does the world need more of this stuff? Like when you're done with this or this test piece is, is gone, does it just end up creating more material in a landfill? And we also see this in reference to education in schools where parents uh, you know, like the idea of 3D printing, but they don't like the idea of their kids just creating more waste in the world, which is totally understandable. Uh, so uh, PET, 
can be recycled in your home recycling to turn into more soda bottles. And uh, PLA can be just thrown out in your normal garbage and it will biodegrade into sugars and lactic acids um, just out in the environment. Uh, it doesn't, it's not a quick thing to do that um, you know, over the course of months or, or uh, years, but it will end up having a net zero effect on landfills, which is a, a very nice story. There's lots and lots of other materials that you can print with that have um, you know, varying degrees of good story and not good story. Um, ABS is one of those. So you can certainly print with ABS, but since ABS is a petroleum product, it is uh, not very good uh, in terms of you can't recycle it. If you look on your recycling spectrum where there's a number one being PET, um, all the way up through you know sevens and eights, uh, the one that is ABS is usually not on that list unless you have a very fancy uh, type of uh, recycling program. So um, ABS is not that good and it's not recyclable, uh, very difficult. There are some benefits to ABS, uh, but I can go into that you know, uh, self. Um, I would rather answer the questions. Uh, so if you have questions, please, uh, please, please um, ask them. If you're not in this, uh, um, uh, if you're not able to ask questions, you don't have the controls, you're just kind of watching this in a read-only mode, um, on the main page where it looks like Bernard has um, uh, asked a couple questions, I can add you into my circles and then you uh, should be able to uh, get into the, yep, um, you should be able to get into the uh, the conference. So uh, certainly just post onto that page and uh, I will see it. And let me just go in there. Okay, uh, so to answer Barbara's question, uh, hoping, and her question is, uh, hoping that you might address the best portable 3D scanner out there. Is it RealSense, uh, Intel-based, looking to scan jewelry items? Uh, so the answer to that is twofold. Uh, scanning in general is very, very hard. Um, and so you certainly can get scanners. I've done quite a bit of scans. Uh, let me... Well... Uh, down in the corner there, I have uh, an Intel, uh, sorry, a, uh, a Microsoft scanner, a Connect uh, V2. So the first kind of scanner that was popularized out on the market was the Microsoft Connect. This is the scanner that is uh, uh, connected to the Microsoft Xbox gaming console. The first Xbox uh, Connect that came out uh First off, Microsoft didn't want people to hack it, so they locked it down, but then they realized that uh, it was actually a good thing that was supporting the Microsoft ecosystem, so then they opened it up with uh, um, all sorts of software development kits, all of that. The Connect is uh, actually a very good scanner, and we use it here in our company when we do scanning for some specialized things. Now, with that said, um, the Connect is not good at um, very, very small objects. Um, uh, if you were to scan uh, the face, like even in this video, you can tell that there's like a little crease on my uh, cheeks, you know, creases in my forehead. If you were to scan with a Microsoft Connect, uh, which are only about $200, um, those wrinkles would barely, barely come out. If you were to scan the ear, the ear would just be connected to the back of the head. Uh, you wouldn't get a whole lot of detail there. Uh, but it is only $200. Now, um, you're starting to see much more of a development in scanners in the consumer realm. Uh, before, probably about a year ago, um, you really only had the uh, Connect um, and then some derivatives of that, but they all used a very, simpler, uh, a very similar uh, kind of... Um, uh, the chips inside were called Prime Sense from a company um, that actually Apple purchased. And then there was nothing until you got up to a very, very high level. Uh, since then, MakerBot, for example, has come out with a scanner. Um, and that scanner is a laser scanner where, I'll take a 3D print here to kind of show you, um, where it works on a platform and a laser comes out. And as the platform moves around, the, the laser essentially scans a line and then builds a 3D model. Uh, that 
hasn't gotten that good of reviews uh, for a couple different reasons. So the scanner is uh, essentially fixed. So if you have something that's like this, it'll scan great. But if you have something with some sort of concave on it, um, the scanner line won't go inside. It can't go up inside. So you would have to end up scanning the object on its side and then doing a lot of cutting and stitching to try to get it aligned. Um, now, with that said, uh, you don't have to even have a scanner in order to do scanning. One of the best and cheapest scanning things that you can do is actually not use a scanner at all. There are services out there that we talk about in our Kickstarter um, in terms of uh, Mesh Mixer being very good at, at working with those scans that use a, a technique called photogrammetry. So photogrammetry essentially is taking pictures from all different points around an object and then you upload those pictures and those pictures get uh, processed by the cloud. Um, in this case, we use Autodesk software, so Autodesk's cloud, and they come back to you with a fully working 3D model. Um, and I'm not sure if I can screen share here, but let me try to show you what this actually looks like. I'm not sure if I have this or not, but uh, let me try a different one. And I can kind of show you once I get something up here. Let me screen share this screen. Awesome, I am disappearing into infinity. Okay, uh, so you should be able to see this screen. This is the, uh, um, this is the Google page. So I'm going to a, a website called 123dapp.com and this is part of Autodesk's uh, portfolio of applications. There's a whole bunch of different applications in here, but this specific one is called 123D Catch. Uh, 123D Catch, uh, as they say here, is a free app that lets you create 3D scans of virtually any object. So if you go up into here under 3D Models and click on that, it takes you to some 3D models. You can say instead of all apps, 123D Catch. So uh, I'm going to click on these, like let's go to this uh, um, Sleeping Weimaraner. I'll click on 3D view. I'm not sure if this will update uh, very quickly or not, but I'll try to go um, a little bit slowly. But you see this build, and then we'll uh, we'll zoom in and try to orient ourselves right here, and zoom into this dog. And as I rotate it, you can see that this is a 3D model of a dog. And um, I can actually download the application, let me sign in, and we'll use this in another example uh, very soon. Hold on one second while I just download this. Okay. So I will go back now and stop sharing. Okay. Uh, and it, And let me select this. Okay. Yeah, and so uh, photogrammetry can create a 3D model without a 3D scanner. Now, obviously, for something like um, uh, you know this room or something like that, you would take a lot of pictures all around. Um, but for a very small object like some jewelry, you would need to get very, very close to the object, maybe even try to find some sort of macro camera that takes up the entire frame of the picture and then take pictures all the way around from every single angle all the way around. If you zoom out, like if your camera is farther away and it's not in the frame or or you have the you know a little ring, um, but you have the desk that it's on and all of that, then um, you won't get a very good uh, uh, quality scan because the scan the uh, photogrammetry software will focus on the rest of the things besides the ring and make the ring you know or the piece of jewelry very, very small. Um, now, there's another problem uh, with jewelry, uh, Barbara, 
is that um, all scanners uh, pretty much use some version of light. Uh, the MakerBot scanner, uh, for example, uses a laser. Uh, there's another one for about $1,400 called the Fuel 3D scanner. Um, that uses uh, uh, essentially photogrammetry, but in a handheld use it unit. And actually, let me go here. and get this out. So this is a, um, and actually the sun is coming in here, so let me uh, move a little bit. Uh, this is a this is an Artec scanner. So this is from a company called Artec 3D. Uh, this is not at all um, low cost. Um, but if you're looking for, uh, I mean, your question was for the best portable 3D scanner for things like jewelry, um, this would be what I would suggest. Although this is about eighteen or nineteen thousand um, dollars, but what this will do is uh, will literally scan the uh, uh, fingerprints on my finger. Uh, it is so accurate; it is actually able to do things like fingerprints, which is pretty pretty detailed. Um, but also the problem with jewelry that you'll get with this scanner, even if it's expensive, you'll have the same problem with $50,000 scanners, $100,000 scanners, all the way down to um, even pictures in the photogrammetry, is that jewelry is uh, shiny and reflective. Uh, this, if you look right here, has a couple of, I can shine it, the right, right? Um, has some LEDs, has some cameras. This is a kind of a webcam lights inside of here, and it projects a grid onto the object. Um, but it does it with light. So if that object is reflective, uh, transparent, shiny, uh, deep, deep, deep black, then the little camera inside of here doesn't have anything to see. And so you run into a problem. The way to get around that, um, and I, I'll show this to you because it's kind of funny if I uh, go into the other room for a second. Hold on. Is, uh, which is, you know, kind of humorous when people come over to the office and um, they see this out. Uh, but this is a foot powder and it might be reversed. Uh, but this is literally just a Dr. Scholl's Odor X foot powder. Um, I try to get unscented. There is no such thing as unscented. But if you look at the uh, ingredients, it's isobutane, which is just the propellant, um, denatured alcohol, zinc oxide, and sodium bicarbonate, and fragrance. Uh, unfortunately, about the fragrance. Um, but what this does is it sprays a fine powder on uh, shiny objects, and then um, they scan beautifully. Uh, so that is totally a way that you can use um, to, uh, you know, very inexpensively, this is, you know, seven or eight dollars, uh, to kind of prep models, even if you're using photogrammetry, um, if they're shiny. Now, another way to do it is you can go to a photo store and get what's called a dulling spray. This is a spray that photographers use to uh, dull down the shine on things, but the, the warnings on that say that the dulling spray can hurt some surfaces and you should test them. Um, I don't know about metal. You would need to try that yourself. I would assume that the dulling spray wouldn't hurt uh, metal, but that is another way to do it. Um, the other final way of doing it, if you want to be extremely, extremely fancy and um, and want to pay a good amount of money, is that uh, you can get a spray bottle uh, that's about double the size of this, like a normal spray can of something called cyclododecane, C-Y-C-L-O-D-O-D-E-C-A-N-E. Cyclododecane is about um, $50 a bottle, uh, of the spray bottle, and it covers uh, three feet by three feet um, with a very thin coating. So it's actually really, really expensive. But the nice thing about that is that it completely sublimates in the air, which means that if you spray something, if you just set that thing aside um, over the course of the next 24 hours, um, or maybe 36 hours if you spray it really thickly, um, that entire spray will just completely vanish. So if you were moving uh, the Mona Lisa, you know, in the Louvre or something, or, or a hugely important artifact, they actually take 
some of this stuff that is uh, in molten form, uh, like in a in a, um, a a liquid slurry, and they paint it on uh, paintings and artifacts to seal it and protect it, and then they ship it, and then they just let it kind of evaporate uh, completely. Um, but it's a very, very expensive uh, thing to do if you're doing quite a bit of it. But um, it is a great dulling uh, thing for uh, uh, 3D scanning. So to answer your, uh, your, your question, uh, the best portable one, I would try to go find a macro camera um, and then uh, take as close up shots as you can get, um, making sure to understand that these camera, as you get close, can distort objects. Um, so you just need to find something that, that, that a really nice quality lens that won't distort it. Otherwise, uh, scanning things like jewelry um, is very, very difficult, uh, especially for anything shiny. Um, yeah, so hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. And if anybody else out there has any other questions, you can kind of um, hover over um, and click the little QA box and then ask a question. And, um, and uh, I will be more than happy to answer that instead of, uh, instead of other things. So let me uh, go back and make sure that nobody has posted on the main page. Um, and you certainly can. Um, again, if you um, if you do have any questions, um, you can post on the main Google Plus page, and it'll pop up, and I can um, add you in to uh, to actually ask questions and all of that. So I'll click on that to uh, mark that question as done. Um, so just to kind of show you, um, this Hangout is about Mesh Mixer. And so Mesh Mixer is what we're running our Kickstarter on. We're offering 20 hours of training starting at $20, which is a pretty awesome uh, value in terms of, of what you would get. And I just want to kind of show you what that what that would do uh, and, and how you would use it. Um, and I'll still monitor this. Uh, uh, I'm going to move this over here and do a screen share again. And I'm going to screen share this one. Good. Uh, so I'm going to start up Mesh Mixer. You can see right here. And I'm going to go, actually, I'm going to open this up and bring over here. So um, I went on to the 123D apps and downloaded that sleeping Weimaraner. So the sleeping Weimaraner came in as a mesh with a whole bunch of textures. This is a um, it comes from photogrammetry, so we could even open up one of these or preview it over here, and you see it's part of the dog's nose, and this is actually just a a, a JPEG file. It's really just a um, it gets wrapped around the mesh, and you'll see this all over in different places. I'll preview this one, different parts of the dog, and it's really just a mesh. So we can go in here and say import, and I'm going to go to where this. Weimaraner is, import this, wait a second for my computer to process it, and there is the dog, kind of turn it inside out here, and hopefully this is updating quickly enough, uh, and I'm just going to go to a normal shader here. Uh, so you can see that I can rotate around this dog. Pretty awesome. It's a full uh, 3D model. A little bit shiny, but we can we can fix that later. If I hit the, the W key, it'll turn it into wireframe. And if I zoom in, you can see that this is the resolution of 123D catch. So we can go to something like the dog's nose down here. Um, and if you kind of vaguely know what, what uh, you know, how wide a Weimaraner's nose is, you know, probably, you know, one or two inches wide, you can see that ever that, let me zoom in a little bit more here, that there are these points right here, these, they're all made out of triangles, they're called polygons. And um, each one of these points is a discrete place that is mapped by 123D catch. So if this were an extremely low resolution, um, and I can actually show you uh, what that would be. 
in Mesh Mixer, I can go in and um, just kind of select an area of this. Um, so if this were low resolution, I could change this and just say accept. Okay. Um, so now in Mesh Mixer, I just changed this. If 123D Catch were extremely low resolution, um, you would get triangles that were spaced very, very far apart. But you can see that if we go over here, there's a lot of little details in here. So it did actually a pretty good job at getting the shape of the dog. If you see there's like some bumps right there. Um, those are probably bumps on the dog, I would assume. Um, you know, the shape of the eyebrows. Uh, if we kind of zoom in here a little bit, let me position it a little bit well. Um, you can see that there is a little indentation for the eye. You know, the eye is closed, the dog is sleeping. Um, not nearly what you would get with something like the Spider, which is the Artec scanner, you know, at $20,000. But you still do get a little bit of an indentation there. Um, so it, do, it was able to gather that there was some little drop in the surface pattern from the face to the eye there. So it does a pretty good job. If you look at it just from outside here, you think, oh, you know, this is awesome. I would be able to do all sorts of things with this. Um, and you certainly could 3D print this dog um, on a color 3D printer, um, not a consumer one, but a professional one. Um, but if you tried to do other things with this mesh, like really try to recreate um, the dog in any other way, I'm going to turn the shading off and you'll see kind of what this looks like. So without the color in there, you can see a dog in kind of a different light. Uh, the skin is kind of mottled. The, the scanner was trying to pick up the, uh, the hair and turn it into kind of a bumpy uh, skin pattern. The dog's skin doesn't look like that at all. So, um, you know, with something like Mesh Mixer, you could go in with, um, you know, various smoothing brushes to kind of try to go in and flatten. So, you know, I'm kind of running the smooth tool on this. Uh, it kind of got rid of the eye a little bit. Um, uh, but that might be a slightly more what the dog is about. But this is really what Mesh Mixer is about. Um, if you go in more and turn in wireframe, you can kind of see, this is an extreme example, but as I click and drag right here, all of those creases, which in this case happens to be the dog's ear, um, start to get kind of smoothed out. So it's a really kind of awesome tool for cleaning up scans. Um, we'll even go in a little bit more and I'll find a bumpy part here like this. And then you can see that it just very, very smooths things out. Um, we didn't actually lose any color on the dog if we go back. So if we go back and turn wireframe off, I can smooth out those kind of dimples on, let me undo that, um, on the dog's nose like this. And now they're all just smoothed out. So that's very nice. Um, it keeps all of the color information there. Um, this blanket is kind of a, uh, it looks probably like the wool inside of the blanket. I can just click on that to kind of smooth out the wool a little bit if I wanted to. Uh, so that's just a, a, a very good example of, uh, you know, I found somebody's model online and now I'm able to go and kind of manipulate it and modify it and, and change it. And I could do all sorts of things like the select tool right here. I can go and just drag and draw a circle around this dog's head. Um, click I for invert, select everything else, and delete it. And then after a second, it will delete it. So now it's a little bit smaller. I missed a little place right here, so I can go back and select and just draw a line through that. It selected that, click delete it. So I'm kind of doing some little scan cleanup right here. Um, and getting just, you know, isolating the parts that I want. And I could go in and, you know, fix this a little bit more if I wanted to. So um, this is just one very easy example of uh, um, what you can do with Mesh Mixer. So I'll stop sharing and I'll move this back. The sun is kind of encroaching on me, so I have to kind of come closer. Um, does anybody have any other questions? You're, you're feel free to ask either on the Google Plus page. Um, or click the little QA button on, if you hover your mouse over the left side of the screen, um, 
a little uh, panel will come up and there's a little Q&A button. And you're more than welcome to click on that and ask any questions that you'd like. Um, I'm more than happy to help answer those because I'd rather not talk. Um, but while that's going, um, I'll talk a little bit more about Mesh Mixer and why we decided to put a Kickstarter on it. So if you, uh, if you do have questions, uh, really, really, please do ask them. Uh, but otherwise, I'll talk about Mesh Mixer and what it can do and why you should be using it. If you do anything with uh, 3D printing, uh, Mesh Mixer is a great, great, great tool. Um, it helps you from anything of creating initial shapes. It helps repair your meshes for 3D printing and can help you build support structures for your 3D prints. So what that means, I'm not sure if I have an example here. Well, something like this. Um, so this is a 3D print of a kind of a pencil holder. I don't have any pencils near me. Uh, yes, I do. Right. So it just goes in here like this. Now, this printed without support structures. Um, OK, Carlo, I got your question about uh, lost wax casting. I will totally answer that right after I'm done with this. Um, so just uh, for the people out there who are not familiar with 3D printing, um, with the materials, with the printers that print with this material. So this is, um, I'm actually gonna move this over here so I'm not in the sunlight as much. Uh, with the FDM machines, um, you can't print things that are overhanged like this um, without special work because you have an extruder coming around and it's melting filament and the filament is uh, flowing out in a molten state move over a little bit, um, in a molten state, and it's essentially a liquid. So if you print something like this, um, it's fine. It prints all the way up. And if you print something like this, it prints a layer and then a layer a little bit out and a little bit out. But once you get more and more of an angle, um, the print, uh, the extruder tries to print out and it just prints in midair. Or um, if you were trying to print somebody uh, with like uh, diving into a swimming pool, and their body was kind of like this. The printer starts here, prints, prints, prints. When it gets here, the extruder jumps all the way over here and starts printing. But if there's nothing to support it, it just prints in midair and nothing happens and you get a failure of your print. So you have to build up support structures underneath. And um, that is something that um, you don't have to build manually. You can use software to do it. Um, normally, uh, that is done in a slicer, but you can do it in Mesh Mixer as well. And uh, Carlo, you um, asked a question. Um, Carlo's question is uh, that he's looking to use PLA for lost wax casting. So any direct experience with that process using PLA. Um, if I go over here... I have a I have a link somewhere to um, yeah I'll, I'll have to find it but there is a there is an artist out there who um, 3D scanned bronzes um, with a scanner and then took them in and modified them a little bit and then printed them out of PLA and then did a lost PLA casting out of bronze uh, because. Um, uh, PLA is a type of sugar, it does burn out when in contact with uh, metal. And so let me see if it's just a quick search, um, lost PLA 3D printing bronze. I'm just going to do an image search because I know, there we go. That's it. All right, let me see if I can somehow, well, actually, let me just do a screen share. If I see it, uh, screen two, we'll go into infinity for a second. Um, okay, so this is a, um, uh, th th this woman is awesome. So uh, the web page is uh, cosmowenman.wordpress.com. So it's just this one right here, C-O-S-M-O-W-E-N-M-A-N dot wordpress.com. Um, you can see it right up here. 
and just to uh, just to make it easier for you, let me uh, go like this just for a second. Bring up Word, paste that in here, and make it bigger for you so that you can see it. Uh, well, you should be able to see it. Uh, Cosmo Wenman, W E N M A N dot WordPress dot com. So that's the that's the address for that. So this person went in and um, uses photogrammetry, so three D scanning. Um, and this person actually uh, uh, went in and uh, just did just took pictures, just like anybody is allowed to do in um, in museums, and then uh, did all sorts of metal lost. PLA process printing from it. Now, if the uh, museum thinks that you're taking pictures of something for profit or you're professional or something like that, um, there may be some issues. You know, obviously this um, horse that's right here um, is probably in the public domain, but um, there are all sorts of different examples on this about lost PLA casting. So um, this is a great website where this person has done all sorts of different bronze uh, uh, and metal casting based on photogrammetry. So um, that is a good one. Let me go back here and move this across. So um, another thing uh, to, to help also, Carlo, answer your question is Mesh Mixer can help with that. Um, Mesh Mixer is... Uh, MeshMixer can kind of help with everything. Uh, let me go in and show you what this would be. If we, uh, I'm just going to go bring in a um, a sphere, right? So I can hit W, and oh wait, I need to actually screen share here. There we go. Okay, there we go. Uh, so this is just a sphere. Um, you know, if you rotate it, it just looks like a sphere. So what I can do is I can go in and bring in a cube and uh, kind of just drag a cube in. I can actually say I want to make that a new object. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is just make the cube super, super large like this. Um, and we have two objects right here. I'm going to translate this and move it so that the sphere is completely inside of that box. Accept. And I'm going to remesh this and make it a little bit more, um, a little bit more dense. So uh, just bear with me here. And I'm going to remesh it again and make it even more dense. OK. Uh, so now what we have is we have this uh, cube with a sphere inside. So you're unable to see it. But you can kind of see it here. This, the sphere is inside. So what we're going to do with this is I'm going to take out the sphere. Uh, so I'm going to click that and that and do a Boolean uh, difference. Oops. And it should do that. Actually, it doesn't like that. Anyway. Um, I'll have to see what this what this is going on. But what the tool is, I'm actually trying to show you, is like this. Okay. So the sphere is inside. Um, you can do something like this for casting, where you actually make an entire box. So what this is is the sphere is um, essentially a. Uh, well, actually, let me do it this way to to really show it. So this is the cube. I'm going to say hollow. and accept. 
there we go. So now I have a hollow inside of this. It's actually, um, you know, it would be the, uh, the, the thing that I would want to uh, fill with metal. Um, you can actually go in and, I find the right tool here, say add tube. And this add tube allows me uh, to go in and uh, make a tube from one place in my model to another. And let me, the screen sharing is actually making it a little bit slow. Um, but what this allows me to do is make escape tubes for, there we go. Um, make escape tubes for um, you know various uh, metals and the gases to come out. So if this uh, interior cube is the shape that I wanted, um, you can actually uh, make different tubes to go in to um, allow metal to go in. So you can print the entire container to um, to print in. And essentially, what you were talking about was doing a lost PLA casting, but you can also um, print the void and then just fill the void with the metal. So you don't actually have to do any lost process at all if you have a container that is able to be printed in the shape that you want. You can actually print the negative instead of using the positive, um, which is a pretty awesome way to do it. Um, stop sharing here. Uh, so I don't know if that helped answer your question. Um, there certainly are people that do, um, you know, all of those processes, you know, I would certainly use a PLA that has the least amount of, um, dyes or colorants in it. Uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, a PLA that is black, right? Um, PLA naturally comes in a, uh, transparent kind of form like this. So, um, I would do it without any dyes, uh, just in the kind of natural form. And um, I, as far as I know, I haven't seen any people that have created a PLA for casting, um, you know, that is specifically designed to burn out properly. Um, but I just do know that people have done it. So, um, but I could be wrong. There's new materials coming out all the time, but I just haven't seen... Uh, people doing that. Normally, you would just go into the resin printers, and the resin printers um, in that area um, w have all sorts of castable resins because the resin is just way more detailed. Um, hopefully, that answers that answers your question. Um, and if anybody else has any other questions, I would be happy to answer them. Um, but besides that, uh, I just kind of wanted to go in. Let me do a screen share again um, and just show you a super quick overview of Mesh Mixer and why it is awesome to use. So, there we go. Um, you can just start out with a, um, you say import bunny, right? There's this, this is called the Stanford bunny. It's one of the initial 3D scans done a long time ago. This comes in um, without a bottom, right? So, Mesh Mixer is not a solid modeling tool. Um, you would have to go to a different tool like Fusion 360 or a CAD tool to do that. Um, it deals with what's called shell-based meshes. Um, so this bunny is not printable as it is. Your print software might try to fix it, but that is a huge hole in the bottom where you can kind of see um, the inside the bunny. So one of the nice things about Mesh Mixer is that it tries to fix these problems. You go down here to Analysis, to Inspector, and you click on that, and I'll rotate it around a little bit. You see this uh, little blue sphere popping out of the mesh. It says that blue is an open boundary. So you can just click on this sphere, and it fixes it. It essentially closes that boundary. And you click Done, and now you have a printable bunny. If I were to go in and make you know, another hole, I go like that and delete it. Um, that would show up and I'll show you what that looks like. Or if you go in and make a super duper small. So now if you see right here in the center, we have a small part. We go into analysis inspector and now it gives me another type of little pin that comes out. So this uh, kind of pink one says that part is under my threshold, which is up here, small threshold. Um, 
And so it's saying that if I click on this, it'll just discard it. You click on that, it gets rid of it. You click on this, and it fills it. It doesn't fill it perfectly, but does a pretty good job. Um, and so that is a really nice thing. If you're dealing with 3D scans, um, usually there's a lot of things floating around your model. And um, this can be kind of a one-click fix to uh, get rid of floating objects and, and open boundaries and all of that. It's very, very nice. Um, now, besides that, you can do lots of kind of neat things. Um, mesh mixing allows you to, uh, let me just bring in like, a head right here. Um, take things like this. This is a bare head that I dragged onto the mesh. I can scale this. I can rotate the head. And if you're looking at this, and let's zoom in a little bit, it's actually updating the mesh in real time for where that bear will fit. So when it drops, you get a mesh that is completely uh, watertight and fine for printing. I can click on this. I'll rotate a little bit, and this is a little pin to help kind of like turn the bed's uh, the uh, bear's head, saying no, I don't want to go here. Yes, I do want to go here, um, and then this little guy helps kind of twist it, which can cause some issues in the mesh as well. But um, so you twist it, you say accept, and now if you look at this, this head is just completely part of the mesh, and. It comes in in what's called a face group, so it's this different color. So I can actually go in and just double click on this color, and I've selected only that part of the mesh, which is pretty awesome. Um, or let's say I'm going to clear that. I can go into select and paint over these ears and say, I want to do something just to these ears. I'm going to go in and paint a selection around that and say edit, sorry, uh, say edit, modify, create face group. So now those ears are a separate color. So I can go in and say select and double click on the ears and now I go back to that selection. And I can do all sorts of different things like um, I like warping. Warping is a cool tool where you double click and add these little pins all around and then you can move one of the pins and then the other pins lock the mesh in place. So you can do some pretty cool things to the mesh. So if I put a, a pin right there, I can deform it this way while the mesh is locked on this pin, which is pretty neat. Let me go back 